This week, motorhomes versus trailers. We share our thoughts on the positives and negatives on owning each. Plus, what exactly is a warranty that's good for full-time use? We dig into that and more. This is RV Miles. Since 1912, L.L. Bean has been helping people get outside together with gear tips and advice for exploring all the possibilities of the outdoors all year long. Here's a quick tip for your next ski, snowboard, snowshoe, or sledding trip. Change into your socks and base layers when you get to the mountain or trailhead, not before. A toasty car ride is a great way to ease into the day, but it might introduce moisture that could make you cold later. Start dry and warm so you'll stay dry and warm. For more tips, easy how-tos, and inspiring stories, visit llbean.com slash explore. Welcome to episode number 307 of RV Miles. I'm Jason. And I'm Abby. And we are two RVers who have been crisscrossing North America on an epic road trip with our three boys since 2016. Here at RV Miles, we talk all things RV and outdoors, from industry news to travel destinations, our national parks, and a whole lot more. This is a big episode because we are coming to you from the very first time from the Mile Zero studio. We did it. We well, we did not really. We didn't do it. There's. Not we're that. coming to you from a corner of the studio. <laughs> we have some like greenery on the wall for those who aren't watching and are sitting in front of it. No, this is not Wrigley Field. And we are not auditioning to be <laughs> announcers for the next season. <laughs> this is actually going to be the wall. This is all greenery behind us. This is actually going to be the wall that you will never see again once we actually get the podcast space built. This is where rarely my desk is actually going to be going (laughs) over here against this wall. But for now, it's offering a little bit of sound absorbency. But nowhere near enough because there is a a decent echo in here. And I'm going to have to do a heck of a lot of work to get the echo out of this podcast, just like I did for the video I just recorded. But we're slowly adding more sound absorption stuff and, and hopefully we'll get there soon to where it's a little bit easier to record in here but it's nice to be able to come down here and record and not record at home and set up everything at home and deal with the kids and all that sort of stuff yeah i mean we're not recording at our kitchen table anymore we're recording on my mom and dad's kitchen table. yeah yeah so this is your parents old but this is their old table, table. that we are sitting at and now we're sitting at my parents card table chairs <laughs> this is a labor of love <laughs> in this space y'all it is there's so much going on but i am thrilled we actually shared the space for the first time with mile marker members on monday night because we had our monthly live stream ask us anything event and we were able to all come together and celebrate being in this space and it was a ton of fun it's great that the kids can be at home and still have their space while we are here doing our work and having our space so this is a lot of fun episode 307 is quite a milestone or mile marker for us that's what, you know, milestone is a mile marker. I know it is, but okay. here we don't call this milestone zero. Okay. I don't know why I had to say that. It's because just, you... That's just who I am. Because that is, that is in your nature, my dear. So we wanted to kick this episode off this week chatting a little bit about RV warranties because there is a, a big consideration that a lot of folks don't consider or they don't necessarily know that it might apply to them even if they're not full-time RVers. So that is the stipulation in a lot of warranties for RVs that you can or cannot use it for full-time living. And we wanted to bring this up because as a lot of you are starting to head out to your local RV show, or this is the time of year where you might be considering a new rig and you're going to dealerships and you're taking a look around, you're going to see some rigs that have this warranted for full-time use language. Yeah, and it's a good thing. Um the the brands that do that are saying that we stand by our unit enough to say to you that even if you live in this thing every day of the year, we will still warranty you. And other brands 
don't necessarily say that. Uh, a lot of brand, the industry standard for the longest time was that full-time living was not warranty. And that's still pretty much the standard in, in most rigs. So really, you're only going to see this now on a lot of the higher end stuff where they warranty it for full-time use. So even within a certain brand, it might not be warrantied for full-time use. But what you need to understand about that is sometimes, so full, what is full-time? So they're, they, they actually define that in the language of your warranty. And with some brands, it might be as little as using it for 120 days out of the year is considered full-time. That's four months. Yeah. Being so, in your rig for a total of four months out of a year yeah. could have them thinking that you're a full-time RVR. So say you are somebody who is just seasonal and you have your RV at, a, you know, a summer camp that you go to, or you take it south for the winter, something like that, that can be considered full-time use. So it's a really important thing to consider if you're going to be a sort of power user of an RV. You know, it, the thing about manufacturer warranties, though, that you have to understand is a lot of them say different things. The sort of standard is it's a one-year warranty, and the warranty is not transferable if you sell it some brands have a one-year total warranty with three-year structural and then there will be other things that are warranted for longer the roofing material is warranted for 20 years which is dumb because it's not the material that goes bad ever it's the holes in the material <laughs> After 20 no. years? No. No, it's the material itself. So, you know, take that stuff with a grain of salt. But, but you know, really it comes down to is, and this is something that's been really been discussed by a lot of RV owners lately, is how that manufacturer actually serves that warranty. Do they stand by their unit? Do they quickly and expediently try to take care of the problems that you're having? Or do they not? So I think when it says it's warrantied for full-time use, that's an indicator that they stand by it. doesn't necessarily mean they do, but it's an indicator that maybe they're more likely to stand by it. So just one more thing you need to think about as you're looking into your new camping season that's coming up and whether or not you're going to be purchasing a new rig, you really want to pay attention to not only the language that they're using with all the stickers that they put on there to catch your eye as you're going in, but really look at the language that's going to be in that fine print when they hand all that paperwork to you. Make sure that you understand it so that you know what you're getting yourself into and everyone is out an even playing field. I just realized that the truck has been parked outside all day in the four hour zone. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, but nobody's fantastic. come and given us a ticket. Not yet. We haven't had a ticket in a very long time. And now we're going to get one because we just oh, brought it up. I don't we think just... we've had a ticket since we, you know, lived in Chicago. Uh, no, I don't. I, I think the last ticket that we got was when we had Bussy parked out front of the apartment and we were yeah, loading was, all of our stuff into it. Was it was Chicago's going away present. It was. Us. They oh. said, come back soon. You know, Chicago. <laughs> we need your revenue. The big cities in general, they sort of. Oh, they, they love it. They live on, on ticket revenue. I, we got to make that quota. Did, did you ever get, I've never had a ticket for a moving violation. Have you ever had a moving violation ticket? I don't think Like I've a ever. speeding ticket? Yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like how many? Like one. I've only had one. Just one. Just one, okay. because well, I understand how to not get one. I take that back. I've had a, I've had a speeding, t uh, not a speeding ticket. I've had a ticket before from a Chicago police officer for a ridiculous reason. I got one in Blue Springs, Missouri, when I was 20 years old, and it was a Saturday morning. I was driving to my voice teacher's house, and I was late because she insisted on 9 a.m. voice lessons on a Saturday from a 20-year-old woman, and I had been out late Friday night, so of course I was very tired and overslept. Ooh, and 9 a.m., that's so late. No, now it's, oh my gosh, I've been up for hours. But I was flying down Interstate 70, trying to get there. I have no idea how fast I was going, but fast enough that when I got off the exit, the cop got off the exit with me and pulled me over, gave me a ticket, and I was late for my voice lesson. So I learned my lesson, though, and I have not had a speeding ticket in 24 years. See, I've been pulled over for a lot of dumb reasons that aren't my fault. The last time 
I was pulled over. I actually did get a ticket. I was in, stuck in an intersection in Chicago. Oh, well, you told me the, the story. The light was very <laughs> short, and I had, you know, everybody had started going. It was a heavy traffic rush hour. Everybody had started going, and I ended up, the car in front of me, surprisingly, stopped right at the other side of the inter- intersection. So I was stuck in the middle of the intersection. And this particular intersection had a no left turn from four to six because that's rush hour. And the reason they do that is to keep the traffic flowing. They don't want cars trying to make the left turn there, which, you know, follows up the, the time that people have to get through the intersection on the lights and everything. But because I was in the middle of the intersection and I was you know, backing everybody up. I was like, well, I guess I better just turn left and get out of this intersection. I didn't even want to go that direction, but there was a cop right behind me. Of course. And she pulled me over and I explained and she's like, well, you have the right to clear the intersection. And I'm like, so I did. I took the left. (laughs) No. So what she's basically telling me is I should have just sat there until traffic cleared. Oh my goodness. And I'm like, I didn't even want to go this way. I was just Going trying. this way to get out of the way. And I wasn't driving my own car. I was driving my boss's car at the time. So that was a whole thing. She's got to run the plates and everything. And it's like, it's not in your name and everything. And she gave me a ticket. Mm-hmm. And that's the only actual moving violation I've ever had. I do believe, I think I need to amend my statement that I've only had two. Because I don't really count these, but it has happened. I got a ticket for going too fast near a park. Remember when they started putting in all the speed cameras oh, around yeah. what they designated parks? And they would designate parks in Chicago. Like, the grass behind me in this video, that's a park in Chicago. Well, it would happen like, with this, this, you will get a ticket. The state of Illinois passed a law that allowing speed cameras, Yeah, but you could only put them within so many yards of a school or a park. So the city just started defining every green space that they own. Yeah, they're not going to put any money into our schools, so, but they will go and make 47,000 new parks. So like the ground underneath the L trains became parks. <laughs> and so basically it turned out like anywhere they could put a speed camera. And they caught me. I have a really distinct memory yeah. of opening up a letter from the city and seeing the Mazda 5 yeah. and then being like, you were speeding. And I was like, I'm you know, I was like, this is so infuriating. I wasn't speeding. I've never been pulled over for speeding. I've been pulled over for crossing the center line. I've been pulled over for going through a red light sort of by accident, but on sort purpose. Of <laughs> sort of by accident, but on purpose I went through this red light. It just happened. It, well, no, what happened? It was a T-shaped intersection, and I was dropping some people off. And I pulled over. It is a dead area. Nobody around. Mm -hmm. Nighttime. I pulled over to drop some people off and was still kind of like the, my trunk was still in the intersection. Stop it. So when they got out and everything and I finally went, they pulled me over for going through a red light because of that little bit of me that was still in the intersection. When How old were you? Oh, I was like, I was like 19 or 20. Yeah. But they didn't give me a ticket. I also been. A, I, uh, here's the best one. I'm sorry, this is running on. Like, uh, here's the best. <laughs> but one. the great before you tell this yeah. one, we do have to say to people, we want to hear your stories. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, now, I need to know: Are we the only two? And I know that we're not. But do, are we the only two that could sit here for ten minutes and talk about tickets that we received? Especially if you've been pulled over or ticketed on an RV. I would love to hear. Yes, we would love. So leave it in the comments. If you're watching this on YouTube, just leave it down there in the comments. If you are listening to this, you can either message us or head over to the RV Miles Facebook group. And, you know, every week we pin this episode in that group at the very top so that we can have an easy to find discussion thread so you can leave it there. All right. I interrupted you, but I wanted to get that out before this epic last story drops. So again, this was a this was busy sort of rush hour traffic pulled up to a light. And it all happens that they all have stoplights. Yours right? are a stoplight. So yeah, there's two lanes um of, of traffic mm-hmm. or, or four however you i never know how you define that is it is i guess it's four lane traffic because four lane two traffic. on my side two on the other side yes so there's two lanes going my direction 
I'm in the right lane, a cop is in the left lane, and we were we're at the light. And then there's another lane that's a left turn lane, right? We're at, sure. We're at the light. It's an intersection I'm unfamiliar with. I had never been through this intersection before. And I start going, and the cop starts going when the light turns green. And I realize my lane after the intersection ends very quickly, mm-hmm. and it goes down to a two-lane road. So I put my turn signal on, and I'm out a little bit ahead of him. And it looks like he's slowing down in his lane to let me in. So I get in and he pulls me over right away. For what? Well, this is what the funny part is. He pulls me over and he's like, I'll let you go if you can tell me why I pulled you over. And I'm like, honestly, I thought you were letting me in. I have no idea why you pulled me over. And he really can't tell me why you pulled me in. And this was clearly not a traffic cop. This was clearly not a beat cop. This was like a detective or something. <laughs> Somebody that didn't have a ticket book. They weren't, you know, he wanted, he asked to see my license, but just handed it back. He didn't like go yeah. run it or anything. So it turned out, he said, I pulled you over for passing on the right. And I'm like, we're at a stoplight at an intersection. So you're telling me if two cars are at a stoplight at an intersection and the car on the right ends up going, you know, slightly faster than the one on the left, but not speeding, that's passing on the right? I mean, I'm all, you know, you shouldn't pass people on the right. It's not just merging, like the lane is ending, you must merge into the other. Well, it's like, I don't know. We'll ask Jack. If we're in heavy traffic and... And the right lane starts moving a little bit faster than the left lane. Yeah. It, are those. all those people, are all those people passing on the right? It uh, was, it was, duh. Um. Well, detective. I still had one cop pull me over. Same, same deal. <laughs> was like a detective oh or something. Didn't Where's have a ticket book. To- and he started, he pulled me over and was screaming at me. Because oh. I was going the wrong way on a one-way street. <gasps> that is a habit. It's uh, not. Your... Listen, what happened was what? So the big parking garages in Chicago downtown. We were know. supposed to be done. We're now into 20 minutes okay. into this episode. But listen, so the big parking garages downtown Chicago, right? You could uh-huh. go on some. So this was the one. This was one by the AMC on Illinois. So I'm in this the parking garage and, you know, you can come out on either side mm-hmm. of the parking garage. Mm-hmm. Like there's different exits. Yes. And one is a one way going one way, and one is the one way going the other way. Yes. That's... I thought I was on the other side that I was on, and there are no signs in the garage that say no left turn or anything. That is a common <sighs> yes, uh, excuse I, of yours. I often will pull in onto a one way if it is a unmarked one way, and that is not my fault. It's done it twice in three weeks. Not my fault. It, that one was clearly over here was clearly unmarked. The person in the passenger seat begs to differ. Mm. All right. Well, we are going to take a break because this has been 20 minutes of riveting conversation. Are you even still here? Are you even still listening? Who really knows? Maybe when you go through and edit this, you might want to cut some of that down a little bit. The heck we'll no. See. That was good content right there. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about motorhomes versus towables, or as Jason said in one of the outtakes, because I know he's not going to keep it in, motorhomes versus Toyotas. That's not what I said. I said (laughs) towables. I'm a foot. (laughs) Towables. We'll be right back. Chances are you've seen them on the road. That's because Blue Ox designs and manufactures the best towing products in the industry. Just look around. You'll find them on highways and campgrounds and anywhere you find people traveling in the great outdoors. Award-winning tow bars, base plates, and brakes. A full line of weight-distributing hitches. Adjustable ball mounts and a new line of fifth-wheel hitches. With Blue Ox, towing doesn't have to be a drag. To learn more about how Blue Ox can make your travel adventures even more stress-free, visit BlueOx.com. This episode is sponsored by the Park Wolf app. Ever found yourself in the heart of a national park surrounded by beauty, but unsure where to go or what to see? That's where Park Wolf comes in. Park Wolf is the ultimate app for exploring national parks. As you drive, the GPS shows you what's coming up on the road, and an audio guide will fill you in on what's there so you can decide if it's worth a stop for you or not. Gas running low, looking for a bite to eat or a bathroom break? Park Wolf's got you covered. It keeps track of the nearest gas station, restrooms, food, and pullover areas. And the best part, it works without an internet connection. 
And if you're a wildlife enthusiast, you'll love Park Wolf's wildlife maps and sighting notifications. So before you set off on your next national park adventure, download the Park Wolf app for your iPhone from the App Store. It's your ultimate guide to national parks. So we're back. And, you know, we've been RV shopping, as we have talked about a lot lately. We've been going to RV shows, doing the thing, seeing all the rigs out there and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, putting together our seminars and talking to folks about buying RVs. So we thought it'd be good to talk about the difference between motorhomes and towables, because it's a conversation that often comes up when there are new buyers out there. And it actually came up for us a little bit. We've been talking to your parents there. They have sort of an interest in RVing Mm -hmm. and they're back and forth on that sort of thing. And we were kind of looking at some motorhomes ourselves too, when we were shopping, I think we've kind of ruled that out again, but yeah. um, And I think as you know, for us, if you've been listening to the podcast for long enough, as we go through the pros and even the cons of motorhomes, you'll probably figure out why they don't work for Abby and Jason at this stage of life. But boy, there were some motorhomes that we have seen lately that have a really sweet bunk setup that wouldn't we like to have that that's, in a towable? That's the weird part is we're seeing some class A motorhomes that have the overcab bunk and then they've yes. got two bunks in the hallway and a rear king or queen bed. And we can't find that in a trailer no, you know, they're fierce. The they're fire. I wish we could get one. All right. Let's uh, start off, though, by defining, because it's always nice to remind ourselves, let's define what a motorhome is. So just to be clear, all motorhomes and trailers are RVs. Um, people argue with me this all the time on YouTube. A vehicle does not mean motor vehicle. A trailer is a vehicle. And motorhomes, by definition, are RVs that can be driven on their own power. Right. They've got a motor in them and ranging from small camper vans up to big 45 foot behemoths with dual rear wheel axles, big motor coaches. But then there's, you know, it's things like school bus conversions like we had yep. camper vans and, and everything in between. Motorhomes fall into three different categories. There's class A's, which are sort of the big bus type shaped ones. But basically what class A means is a vehicle that is built on a custom chassis that is specifically really meant to be a motorhome. So they have those sort of just frame rail chassis and they build up from there. Class B is a camper van. A class B is a commercial van built by Mercedes or Dodge or Ford that the manufacturers have altered to be a camper van, to be an RV, to have RV facilities in it. And then class C is sort of a hybrid. It is on a van or a truck chassis that is sort of cut away. So they sort of build this thing on top of a van chassis. So it's kind of in between them. And then you'll also hear about B plus RVs. A B plus is, is technically a C, but a B plus is like a small C that kind of looks like a class B. It doesn't have that big cab overhang that right. you see on a lot of them. So. But it's still a motorhome. So class A, class B, and class C. So we wanted to break this down a little bit and share just a few. There are a lot of pros and a lot of cons about all types of RVs. And so we could be here for hours and hours talking about that. But we just want to break down a few of the more universal pros and a few more of the universal cons that come with each type. So with the motor home, we'll start with the pros first. One of the big things you're going to get with a motor home is that you're going to be able to access the entire coach the passenger will be able to while the RV is in motion. And that is that can be really huge. That's the ability to get up and go use the restroom or pop into the refrigerator to get a soda or to get a drink. This is one of the things that you're not going to be able to do with a towable because you're going to be in the vehicle that is towing the RV. Here in a motorhome, you have all of this access. And if you're not comfortable th- with that, and let's just say here right now, we're not going to judge seatbelts and moving around and all that sort of stuff, but you do need to abide by the laws that are out there. But if you're not comfortable with that, it still can be nice to just pull over somewhere and be able to walk back there immediately as well without having to get out and open up the trailer and pull down the the stairs and all that sort of stuff. And sometimes trailers are blocked by slides and everything on the inside. So motorhomes usually have accessibility to all that sort of stuff. They're also 
a lot of luxury amenities that come with the bigger Class A's, with the real high-end Class A's that the, you're going to find. The big Class A motorhome chassis can carry a lot of weight. Mm-hmm. So they're often better built because they can carry a lot more weight. One of the biggest problems in RV construction is trying to keep them light enough to be able to be towed or for the motorhome chassis or whatever. But the big Class A's, especially the diesel ones, can haul a heck of a lot of weight. So they don't worry so much about what they put in them. Some of them even have like tile floors and granite countertops. Yeah, let's talk about what we mean by luxury amenities. You just mentioned two of them. The heavy granite, you know, you're going to have these really luxurious tile floors that are often heated. You know, they're going to have high-end finishes in them that, again, are going to have some weight to them because they can do these things. You're just going to find a level of class inside of those in regards to finishes and how these are put together that you're not necessarily going to find even in a towable that on the more expensive end because again we're talking about weight here it's all about what can this rig hold and then you're probably you're gonna find a larger cargo carrying capacity in some of these amazing class a's they can just hold more you're gonna have these enormous like under storage bays that are gonna have these big sliding drawers that come out of them they're really they're they can do quite amazing things with class A's. Now, you're not going to find that kind of level like in the class C or the class B. They're going to have to work within the specs that they have. But when you're talking about a class A, if you're wanting something that you don't have to think about anything that you put in there. And when we had our bus conversion, I never once thought about cargo carrying capacity. Yeah. Now the the thing is you're going to pay for those oh, finishes for sure. and amenities and that's why class A RVs will often, you know, can be the most expensive. Not always. There are some gas ones or some lighter weight ones that aren't as expensive, but the the most expensive RVs out there are certainly the big class A's. Let's go to the complete other end of the motorhome and that's mm-hmm. going to be your van life, your class B. And one of the really appealing things about a class B is how nimble they are, how quickly you can get from one place to another, how you can fit into almost anything. A lot of people who own Class Bs, who own vans, they don't bring another car with them. You have this van that if you don't mind, you know, kind of having to unhook and, and do all of that and break down camp a little bit, you've got this thing that you can take anywhere. You can take it into national parks. You can take it to the grocery store. You can take it into town. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to fit because you're essentially just driving a van. Yeah. The other thing is pets really have a lot more freedom when you have a a motorhome. Like you have the ability to sort of let them, you know, go lay on a bed or wherever they Mm -hmm. want to do or crate them or whatever. But that's a little bit harder to do in a truck you know, when you're towing a a trailer. So there are a lot more pros out there to the motorhome, but those are some of the more bigger ones that people consider. Now let's talk about some of the cons that come with the motorhome. And of course, that's going to be a lot of people end up having to tow a vehicle behind them, which means you are now, especially if you didn't come into this situation, owning something that can be towed two down or four down, then now you're looking at not potentially having a car with you or having to rethink like your daily driver altogether. So that can be an added expense. And plus, it's just one more engine that you have to take care of. It's one more thing that you're well, maintenance on. And a lot of people, you know, they avoid trailers because they don't want to tow. Mm-hmm. And then you end up towing anyway. And a lot of people, when they start out RVing, will buy a motor home and think that they're not going to want a second car with them. And then their second year, yeah, they definitely have a, a, a car with them. Whether they tow that or somebody else drives it behind them or not, that you can do it either way. Absolutely. Um, but but it is kind of a pain if you are in a bigger motor home to have to like take everything down to go you know, explore a national park or like to go to all the different parking areas and stuff and that thing. Well, to be honest, Jay, you're not going to explore a whole lot of national parks in your class. Well, we've seen people try. We we (laughs) try being the word there in that sentence. We've seen them try. And certainly you can do that. It's a little bit easier with class season, a little bit easier. And for sure, much easier with a Class B. But there are going to be limitations. You are not driving your Class A. You're not driving your motor home to dinner at a local restaurant. You're 
potentially not driving it to a museum that you want to go check out. You may not even be able to, you can't drive it to most trailheads. You're not going to be able to leave that class A at a trailhead unless it's a huge parking lot. So another big con is car seats. There's a whole big debate that we won't really get into about car seats in motorhomes and whether the car seat placements that some of the manufacturers have put in are safe or not, because they're not crash tested. Motorhomes are not crash tested. No. Now I will say motorhomes have a way lower death per mile rate than all other passenger vehicles, but you know, it's your children, right? So this is something that people are very cautious about. So, you know, I'll leave that on, on, on you to research. And just remember though, and I mean, this is law, like it's, Forward facing or backward facing. You still have for to follow car seats. all of those laws. Still have to. So you need to consider that when you're looking at that motor home. If you're going to need car seats, will they be able to be forward facing or back or backwards facing? And this goes for grandparents too. If you're thinking I want to get this motor home and then I want to have space to have the grandkids come out with us for a couple weeks every year. Well, if you have little grandkids that are going to need to be in car seats, you're going to have space where they can be latched in and that car seat can be latched in forward facing in order for you to be able to bring them along. Another big con is if, if you're a full timer or if you're somebody that's going to travel significantly, if you do have issues, if you do have to have work done on the on the actual motor portion or the, you know, any of the drivable portion of your RV, well then you gotta move out of it in order for that to get fixed. Mm -hmm. The but the biggest con really ends up being the price. Motorhomes are significantly more expensive than a travel trailer. So I think this is why when uh, a lot of people first, first start looking at RVing, most people sort of get in love with the idea of a motor home. But then in the end, 90% of RVs sold, and that's not an exaggeration, that's the actual number. And it's actually increasing. So now it's, I think it's like 91, 92% of RVs sold are trailers. And it's because People go and see them and they price them and they're like, well, well, I think I can figure out trading in one of my cars for a truck and getting a towable uh, a lot more affordably. Because if you already have two passenger vehicles at home as your family, right? You know, the typical family with your two cars and your two and a half kids and whatever. Yes, 2.2 two kids. <laughs> uh, you've got your you got your two cars at home. Trading one of those in is already some equity that you have to put into this venture. Well, this is a really good place to transition then into towables or trailers. A uh, towable is defined as an RV that is generally going to be pulled behind a truck or an SUV that has those kinds of capabilities as well. It is conventional travel trailers, fifth wheels, truck campers, and pop-ups. There are what, hundreds of different types of fifth wheels, hundreds of different types of travel trailers. They're all going to range in different price points. And I think that this is why that number that Jason just talked about, that almost 92% are travel trailers, is because you can buy a pop-up for just a few thousand dollars or a fifth wheel for $150,000. So there's just this really wide range of accessibility when it comes to getting into a towable. So let's talk a few of the pros mm -hmm. about the towable. Um, so again, often la la often drastically less expensive than a motorhome. So for instance, you can get the top of the line, top of the line fifth wheel. I mean, $200,000 fifth wheel, top of the line fifth wheel and tow it with top of the line top of the line truck so let's say another a hundred and twenty thousand dollars yikes <laughs> so you're, that's three hundred and twenty thousand dollars right there that's a mid-level class a motor home mm -hmm. you know the high-end ones go for significantly more mm -hmm. but that's top top of the line fifth wheel and truck and of course you can go much further down from there. Right? Yeah. So, you know, we should say we started off with the motorhome, like we just talked about. Yes, our schoolie was actually registered as a Class A motorhome, mm -hmm. and we started off with that. But since then, we have had three towables that have followed. And I think some of the pros of the towable really apply to us and how we are as RVers and a family. And that really does come down to 
if you're going to have to purchase something new and expensive, purchasing a new expensive truck is going to hold its value longer than the motorhome. Absolutely. The depreciation, you're putting less depreciation into your whole RV adventure if you're buying a truck and a trailer and you're probably getting a better interest rate on the truck probably than, than you are on the trailer you're probably having a little bit easier time financing however you can get longer terms on a trailer or a motor home so if it's just about payments for you well you get a 20-year loan on a motor home if you want to Oof. 20 I'll, however I, w- I will say if you're going to get a 20-year loan on an rv get it on a motor home and not on a travel trailer but they they do last significantly longer that's the reason that they allow them to be a little bit longer on motorhomes sometimes it's you know the average auction year of a motorhome is it's eight years and the average towable is like four years so it's significantly longer that that people are trading in their motorhomes it's not half of your 20-year loan though no doesn't even make it to 10 years. One of the things about a towable, though, that can be a pro, or for some it can be a con because it can be really overwhelming, is that there are a lot of different floor plans with towables. Yeah, there is. I mean, we talked to the folks at Keystone who make everything from fifth wheels down to the tiniest travel trailers, and they had mentioned that they have, throughout all their brands at Keystone, 400 floor plans. A lot of floor plans. You're not going to find that sort of uh, wide range in motorhomes at all. No, you're not. And of course, these are ranging from family floor plans to couples to small adventure travel trailers that are really only meant for one or two tiny people to be in it together. So again, take that with a grain of salt. Floor plans can mean all different kinds of floor plans for all different kind of RVer. But that can be a really great pro for someone that's not sure what they're looking at. We've already talked a little bit about the wide range of price points. There is a bigger opportunity for you. A lot of people get their feet wet in RVing with what is called like the entry travel trailer, like the, the entry towable. And that's going to be something that's on the on the lower end of the price point. We're seeing a lot of these right now in what everyone's calling these decontented RVs, the all-access RVs, or the essential RVs, they they tend to be more on the entry-level travel trailer price point. Yeah, but you can you can get one, you can get a small entry-level travel trailer for fifteen thousand dollars, where your cheapest motorhome is probably going to start around seventy. Yeah. So, and that's going to be a small little class yeah. C, most likely that you're going to see somewhere in and around that price point. Maybe a van, but I don't think I've seen any vans in the RV shows yeah, yet at I mean, around 70,000. You know, I'm not even, I think 70 might even be low, but yeah. $15,000 plus your truck that you already have, say you're getting a, an affordable ish, just say you're going to buy a new truck, but it's going to be a, a mid range, you know, like an F-150 that's going to cost you $40,000 or something like that. Now you're into RVing for $55,000. So you're still in it way less than the cheapest motorhome. Of course, you won't have to break down camp every time you want to go somewhere. You get there, you can put out all of your things, and then all you do is you hop in your tow vehicle and you go off and explore. There is a potential for you to be spending less on fuel with a towable than you would by having a motorhome. Now, we argue that's actually kind of a wash, and you should never really take that into consideration because you do have to factor in the fact that you're going to be driving your tow vehicle all around, yeah, so most likely. You, so you tow if you tow a little smart car behind your motor home, that thing's gonna get, you know, go zip, zip. go a long way on a tank. Absolutely. So that's a little bit of a wash. I think a lot of that is really personal RV or preference. If you're just headed to the campground down the street from your house, you know, a few times a year, you're for sure probably going to save more money with the tow vehicle than you are gonna be driving it over there with the motor home, but I don't know. That doesn't seem like a lot of fun. You need to go out and explore some more. Go beyond <laughs> Go beyond your neighborhood campground. So the cons begin with with the actual towing Back portion. to the and track. A lot of people are concerned about towing is, it's no more difficult than driving a big motorhome. 
it, it's something that anybody can figure out, anybody can learn to do, even with the tall and wide and long fifth wheels. Actually, they kind of tow a little bit easier than some of the larger travel trailers, so don't be scared of, the, of them just because of their size. But what a lot of people don't understand when they first get into RVing is how big of a vehicle you need to tow some of the RVs that are out there. A lot of RVs are going to require that you get a three-quarter ton or a one-ton truck. So that's like an, an F-250 or an F-350 if it's Ford or a 2500 or 3500 if it is Ram or Chevy or perhaps even a Dually, which is a truck with four wheels in the back and, and two in the front. And that is a significant cost. And those vehicles can get significantly large and can be a pain in the butt to park. You know, maybe you don't have a spot in your garage to park them and that sort of stuff. And of course, you have to consider the cargo carrying capacity of the towable because that is another one of those numbers that is all over the place. Do not assume because it is a bigger like fifth wheel or travel trailer that you're going to have massive cargo carrying capacity. And when we say cargo carrying capacity, we mean what you're putting into the RV, how much weight you can put inside that RV. They are not all equal. And so you really need to consider that as well when you're looking at these, how much can I tow along with how much can I carry? So this is the whole towable world. There's just no rhyme or reason to how cargo carrying capacity. No, it's all over the place. It's so weird. It's all over the place. Some of the biggest, heaviest fifth wheels will have terrible cargo carrying capacity. I mean, we're talking like 800 pounds in this giant fifth wheel. And part of that is because they've gone in sometimes and put in the finishes that look really similar to what you're going to see in that Class A. But guess what? It's not on that Class A chassis. So all of that weight is just eating away at what you then get to put into the RV to make your vacation work for you. So it's very random. You really need to pay attention to your cargo carrying capacity. And then I think finally we'll wrap it up with the cons here on towables by just reminding you that unlike the Class A, and again, you have to, with a Class A, it's your level of comfortability about whether or not you want to get up as a passenger and go to the bathroom while the vehicle is in motion, You cannot do that, obviously, with a towable. Everyone is in the tow vehicle. So if you need to access a bathroom, you need to access your kitchen, you're going to have to pull over safely in order to do that. And then you have to remember that in some towables, especially ones with slides, you can't access. There are some you will not be able to access a bathroom or a kitchen. We have owned two out of three of our towables. We did not have bathroom or kitchen access on a travel day due to a slide being in. Yeah, because even even though the motorhomes will often have slides in them, you can usually still access everything with the slide in. Mm -hmm. So that makes it really convenient for both, you know, rest stops for lunch and, and, and the restroom, but also for overnighting in a parking lot at a big box store or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit easier in most motorhomes because you don't have to put those slides out. And some towables, you just have to put the slide out in order to access something. And that can be a real pain in the butt. And you, it's something you have to really be careful about too, because if the rig is not level, When you go to put that slide out, let's say you just want to stop and you just got to get to that bathroom, you need access to that kitchen, and you go to put that slide out, but your rig is not level, just be careful. Like there, you could end up doing some damage to the slide, and then that is a whole issue all on itself, and it's a headache. Yeah. So overall, I think, you know, for us, obviously, the the decision really is that we prefer a, a towable and I think mainly that came out of us being full-timers as a family. And, you know, the, we spent a lot of months when we were in our bus conversion in hotel rooms while things got repaired. And um, we were in a bus conversion and, you know, that yeah, it was comes old. with the territory but, but it could a be this bit, if you but... You could buy a 20-year-old motorhome and, yep. and it would be the same thing. So for us as full-timers, it was really significantly about the fact that we, if there was a problem, we still wanted to have our home. 
we only wanted to take care of one engine. That's really what it came down to. And I think that later on in life, I could absolutely see us owning a motorhome. I love motorhomes. They've just never really been able to work with our particular RV lifestyle. I love motorhomes. I, I love vans. De- I can definitely see you and I when the kids are gone in a in a in a large van. Yeah. <laughs> Not I can small see van. myself in my own little van just doing little zip zip trips. Like yeah, just well, taking off too. on my own me and too. going to do my thing and sometimes we'll have our own little vacations. We don't always have to vacation together. So if you're looking to buy I, <laughs> You're not gonna answer that. You're just gonna let No, <laughs> I'm I'm with you on that. That's good. I mean my parents have a, a dog that makes it hard for them to vacation and they vacation separately all the time. Yeah, I think so, there's something to be yeah. said about having just time to I yourself. Mean, I would love to have the option to vacation together, but... I, yes, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I love spending time with you. You're like my yeah. best friend, but I do not at all mind going for a couple days somewhere just by myself. So we hope that helped you if you're looking to make a decision on, on buying, if you're in a search somewhere. But if not, if you're uh, somebody who is an owner of an RV, we'd love to hear your thoughts on what some of the things that you uh, think about the rig you own and the, you know, the sort of grass is greener on the other side syndrome. Is there something that you wish that you could do that you can't, whether you're in a motor motorhome or a towable or. Yeah. What uh, are your pros and cons? We would love to know of both sides of this coin. What pros and cons do you see when it comes to RVing? So you can leave those again here in the description. If you're watching this on YouTube or just pop over to the RV miles Facebook group. All right, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we will check the level of our tanks. We'll be right back. RV Miles is sponsored by eTrailer. Did you know that eTrailer.com is focused on putting actual hands on the products they sell? That allows representatives to see, touch, and know exactly what it's like to use the product, providing you with quality service and recommendations based on personal experiences. If you're looking for a one-stop shop, eTrailer.com has you covered with a variety of RV items, including towing options, interior accessories, replacement parts, storage, and more. Visit eTrailer.com slash RV miles and receive free shipping on orders over $99. That's eTrailer.com slash RV miles. On the open road, freedom is measured in miles and home is where you park it. For the modern RVer, the journey is just as important as the destination, and that's where RV Life Pro comes in, the ultimate travel companion. RV Life Pro is an all-in-one platform that transforms RV travel with RV safe routes. You can navigate with ease, avoiding low bridges, weight limits, and those steep winding roads. The interactive trip wizard acts as a personal travel planner, helping to map out adventures, manage stops, and even estimate trip costs. With RV Life Pro, you're always one step ahead. Real-time weather alerts and updates to ensure you drive under clear skies and starry nights. And when it's time to rest, the extensive campground directory filled with unbiased reviews from fellow RVers means finding the perfect spot to recharge is a breeze. Travel days can be full of surprises, but with RV Life Pro's offline navigation, you can find your way even when the signal fades. Capture the moments that matter and share the journey with a community that's as passionate about RVing as you are. It's time to elevate the RV experience. Millions have already discovered the RV Life Pro difference. Plan smarter, drive safer, and live the RV life to the fullest. Ready to start your adventure? Visit RVLife.com and use the code RVMILES to save 25% off on RV Life Pro today. Welcome back. And it is time to check the level of our tanks. Sponsored by Liquefied RV Toilet Treatment, the no BS toilet treatment. You can find it in the RV Miles Amazon store. Just head on over to Amazon.com slash shop slash RV Miles. Okay, Jay, what is filling up your black tank this week? <sighs> It's so warm outside, you know, like gloomy warm, you know, 50 degrees and melting snow. I love it. I mean, and fog and it, the thing is, so y'all know that I got back into skiing this year. I have been once. (laughs) Yeah, it's awful. And then we went to Florida and stuff and it snowed like crazy here. It snowed, I think over 20 inches here. And by the time we got back. Most of it's gone. Hey, Jason, you want to tell the people how we're making that up to you? 
so that you can well, get some skiing in? Would okay. you like to, since you've been playing your tiny violin here, do you want to go ahead and let everyone know what you're going to do instead? I, well, I, I need to prepare, though. That's the problem. Oh, okay. Well, so your dad I, has that fun little ski machine downstairs at his house. <laughs> can get on that. For my dad's birthday, my brother, who lives in California, and I and my dad are all flying out to go skiing at Jackson Hole. It's going to be so awesome. I, I'm very excited to get out there. I've never been there, and it's been a long time since I've skied at a big place like that. So uh, we're going to get to go for almost a week, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I would like to get in a few more reps on, I, you know, the local ski hill I before agree. I get out there, though. We'll have to send you out to Dubuque because they continue to make snow regardless They're making of snow here, too, but the, the temperature is too high now. I was told by a local that they are still making snow out there and you can even ski out in Dubuque even when it's in the 50s. Look, that is just local intel. I, I can't tell you it, if it's a fact. It's the same here. Like, I mean, Snow Star here is still open on some days. It's just really bad. And it's like bad for your skis to go over. So I'm brand new skis and there's gravel and rocks no, and I get it. And stuff. You know? I get it. You're just going to have to cut your teeth yeah. in Jackson Hole. I'm yeah. really excited for you and your dad and your brother. This is the first time the three of you as adults have ever done anything like this before. And so I'm really glad that you guys are going to have that opportunity to go and spend time together and get out on the slopes. I'm sure your brother is going to give you a lot of grief for the lack of years that you've been skiing but other <laughs> that's the great thing about you know my my brother lives in the LA area and the great thing about California is it's you know you drive three hours and you're up in the mountains and big ski yeah. areas and all this stuff so he skis all yeah. the time and he definitely kept that skiing I mean, momentum going all through his adult yeah. life and he's also you know single in his 40s making <laughs> a kids. decent amount of money and can fly wherever he wants and work from home and stuff so yeah that sounds so nice sometimes yeah. especially when i talk about my fresh tanks here in a minute <laughs> all right what is in your fresh tank though this week uh, my fresh tank is our friend terry over at spot tonight spot tonight if you don't know is a an app for fun and a website for finding last minute camping reservations and it's sort of starting to become a place where you can just book lots of reservations if you want to like look at what's available across lots of different campgrounds in a given area, check out Spot Tonight. It's with the number two, not the letters T-O. So Spot number two, N-I-T-E. Mm -hmm. And Terry sent us, Terry's from Louisiana. We we saw him at the Florida RV Super Show. And we, we were sharing stories about Louisiana and our love of camping down there and everything. And Abby, of course, lived in Louisiana for a little bit when she was little and Terry sent us a king cake for Mardi Gras season here so we just we just cut into the king cake last night yeah you know, they don't put the baby in it anymore the baby's no. like in a plastic bag so you gotta shove the baby in and hide it yourself <laughs> Gosh, so that so baby Abby's like there. Abby did that <laughs> so Abby puts the baby in the king cake and then she's she cuts the slices and hands uh -huh. them out to everybody and she's like, oh look I got the baby <laughs> How did that happen? It's amazing. Well, what happened? I, now, according to, so this was very nice because I had mentioned to Terry, because we were just talking and I had mentioned, oh, you know, it's Mardi Gras season. And I had said, oh, you know, there's a local bakery up here in the Quad Cities that is taking orders for king cakes. And I'm, when I get home, I'm going to order one because, you know, I'm going to go with their kids. And he was he's like, uh, he's, no. you're, not, you're not eating an <laughs> Illinois no king Illinois. cake. <laughs> not on my watch. <laughs> so he sent us one from uh, a local bakery in the south that uh, makes amazing king cakes sent those up to us we've thoroughly been enjoying them i took a couple it's over huge it's enormous i took some over to your dad and tammy tonight because i did a, it's basically like i did a food exchange tammy had her greek lemon orzo soup waiting for us she had extra that she wanted to know if we wanted and then i was i brought them some king cake because they've never had it before mm -hmm. and they didn't even they didn't know the story mm -hmm. 
So I, did, I told them the whole story of the king cake and like what it represents. And so the, they got a little bit of king cake themselves tonight. So it was quite nice. It's very nice to have your parents only two blocks yeah. from us. Yeah, Just pop true. over yeah. and get some yeah. soup from my mother-in-law. Got leftovers? Okay, <laughs> we'll eat them. <laughs> but they called and they were like, we have these leftovers. Do you guys want them? And we we're like, heck yeah, we do. All right. What's in your black tank this week? Uh, so my black tank is really short because I have a couple fresh tanks. And I hesitate to call this a black tank. It is a black tank. Why not? I'll call it what it is. We've just had, it's been, it's been hard being a parent lately at our house. It's just, it's been very hard. And this will actually feed into the conversation that we're going to have on Detour this week. So uh, Detour is the podcast that we do the show after the show. We do a 15-minute podcast for Mile Marker members every week. And we kind of pull back the curtain a little bit more there. I would say we're, we're a little bit more open and uh, a little bit more of an open book on these shorter episodes. And so this week, we're going to talk about what it's like being married to your business partner. Yeah, I was just surprised with this topic. So <laughs> somebody is prepared for it and somebody is not. And that's fine. That's the spice oh, yeah. of life. That's, and so Sounds like I did job, but okay. <laughs> not. But if you want to <laughs> check like out Sounds like I'm being set up. You are not, I promise. <laughs> if you would like to talk if you would like to listen to that episode and you would like to support the work we're doing here at RV Miles, you can just go to rvmiles.com slash mile marker. Membership starts as low as just $7 a month, and that gets you access to every single perk that we offer, including all of these back episodes, our monthly live stream, subscription to RV Today, or you can save two months and become an annual member and join for the entire year for $70. So if you're interested, rvmiles.com slash mile marker. But my black tank is really just about, it's it's been very hard to be a parent and then to be a full-time working parents as well. Yesterday, things got very hard at home. And I got to a point where I had to call Jason, who was here at the studio, and I said, I, I need you to come home. It was like the first day that I was working, like, all day at the studio, too. Yeah. So it was like... Um, so that felt great. That felt great. Where I was, Teenagers, man. It's, it's, oh. it's tough. Uh, so I... This is not a slam on our children. This is just uh, a lot of transitions and a lot of growth and a lot of changes happening and a lot of big emotions. And sometimes you need to call in some backup to ensure that your own big emotions are not going to overshadow what is best for the family. So, but with that, I would like to say that my fresh tank, and I'll just roll right into it, is I have two, but I want to do this one that that comes in with the black tank. So it was really tough yesterday at home and like I needed at the end of the night, you came home and you needed to step in. It had been a long day. And I took Henry to gymnastics out in Davenport. And I have this hour uh, where he's in class. And so I thought, well, I might just go over to Barnes and Noble and walk around or something. And so I was like driving and I didn't really feel like walking around and looking at books. I really just wanted to sit down somewhere and just stare at a wall because I was super overwhelmed. And in the parking lot of where Barnes and Noble is, there's an olive garden. And I was like, that's where I'm going. I'm going to go to Olive Garden. I'm going to order a glass of wine. I'm going to sit there and I'm just going to stare at the wall and drink this glass of wine and just be chill. And, and nobody will notice. <laughs> no one will talk to me. No one will want anything from me. It, I can reset and come home and tackle the rest of the evening. So I go in there and uh, I must have just kind of looked like a dejected mom. Like, I just must have had uh, been radiating some real, real vibes in this Olive Garden because the two women who were behind the bar, they, you know, they make me my glass of wine and they just kind of keep chatting me up and they're like, can we get you something to eat? Do you, are you sure you don't want a bowl of soup? Like, can we get you anything? And, you know, and then the one woman, she starts to talk to me a little bit just about, she said, you know, she brought up something about motherhood or her kid. And I said, oh, yeah, I get, you know, I'm not very responsive because I'm just, I just really want to sit here. But she says something about, you know, she has a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old. And I say, oh, I've got a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old at, at home. And that kind of opens the door to this conversation about being the parent of teenagers and they learn that her 16-year-old is autistic, nonverbal, and we're just talking about 
the struggles. And then all of a sudden she just says to me, she's, you know, I just, it just seemed like tonight, you know, you, you could, you needed to talk to somebody and, you know, if you want to talk, you know, and I was just kind of blown away because I needed the person that I needed to end up talking to, I needed to talk to was another mom who, or another parent, I should say, that was raising teenagers and understanding how difficult and wonderful that can be at the same time, but how sometimes that's really hard. And these two women, unprompted, were exactly the kind of like people I needed to talk to. And it happened in an olive garden at a the Olive Garden. Yeah, bar. I mean, like, Felicia and I have an <laughs> unwritten rule that I don't sit at the bar at chain restaurants. No Applebee's oh, bar, I no Chili's bar, it. garden bar. Those are like kind of hard and fast rules for me. But uh, see, I but Olive Garden, I think, would be the the first no. one of those that I would go to. So I w- I'll give you that. I'm not that. I I don't have any. I will. I don't have any levels like that. But it's very hard to put into words. But I left. The Olive Garden with my new friends who work every Tuesday night and they were like, you should come back next week. And, you know, they and I won't go into all of the specifics of what we talked about, but, you know, they really did kind of just they were just an ear for me to share my frustrations to people who didn't know me, who didn't know my kids, but who could still relate to me because we all have raised teenagers. And as I'm leaving, one of them, she comes, leaves around the bar to walk me out. And I'm thinking at first, I'm like, oh gosh, is she going to hug me? And I'm like, do I want to hug? Maybe. I kind of want to hug. But then like, so she doesn't hug me, which is fine. But I was like, I'd take a hug if she was going to hug me. And we're leaving. It's just going to be, I'm going to give you this. So, you know, you want you to go home and I want you to take all of these. And she hands me this enormous handful of those chocolate mints that they give out at Olive Garden with your check. She just takes just all, she just hands them all to me. She's like, here, you take these and don't share them. And I was just like so touched. I was like, oh my gosh, thank you. Yeah. Of course, she doesn't know that you don't like mints. I don't like them. So Abby gets home and she just dumps them all in my in, I walked in my nightstand drawer, which is great. Which you, I said, <laughs> well, it was my way of saying thank you for coming home and stepping in. Here is a gift from Olive Garden. <laughs> and so it was really nice. That was a fresh take. It was very nice to meet that person in the community. And then my other fresh take continues to be about community. We ran into or got to meet the organic vegan grocer across the street <laughs> from us. I know this sounds so bougie. But they were closed on a Monday and we didn't realize they were closed. I was with Jack and we just walked up and tried to come in and the door was locked. And he came over and he was like, oh, do you guys need something? Do you want to come in? Do you need to get something? He's, we are normally closed on Mondays, but we'll open up on a Monday for a community member if they just need to come in and buy some groceries. And so I was like, are you sure? My son just wants something to drink. I was like, it's really no big deal. And he's like, no, come in. So it lets us in. He's in there. He's a dad. He's got two grown sons who also run this grocer with them. They introduce all of us. I introduce myself. I say, hey, we're, you know, we're the new business across the street. My husband and I are just over there like working right now. And he's, oh, are you guys the podcasters? And I was like, yeah, we're the podcasters. Right, that got around. <laughs> and I wasn't thinking to myself, how does anyone know? Uh-huh. We've not talked to anyone. We haven't told anybody. Like, how do y'all know? And then I thought, oh, small business, small town everybody knows. And so he was very kind. He ended up giving Henry a handful of cookies. People really like to give you treats when they meet you here in the Quad Cities. Gives Henry a handful of fresh baked cookies um, from the Delanese. Hey, mom, is it okay if he has these? And took them back over and was just really excited to have us here on the street and in the downtown area. And I just thought that was really cool to meet. It's the first time as a small business owner that I, you know, I own a storefront. I own a studio. And I met my, you know, my vegan organic grocer friend across the street there. And I just, I thought that was really cool. So uh, a couple really nice uh, community fresh tanks for me this week. Nice. All right, that's it for this week's episode of the RV Miles podcast. Yes, it is. And of course, you know, if you have any questions for Jay and me or thoughts and opinions on this episode, you can find us over in the RV Miles Facebook group, or you can email us at editor at RVMiles.com. But until next week, stay safe 
hey, if you see someone sitting up at the bar and they look like a human who just needs to stare at the wall, maybe let them stare at the wall or come over there and be exactly what they need. It's your call. Either way, keep logging those RV miles. Bye, everybody. Bye.